So, all right. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, taking some time today on what's turning out to be a fairly nice day out there. Um, what I wanted to do with this session, as I sort of talked about at the beginning, I was at a uh, conference, an education conference last fall, and one of the things that came up at the conference is there was a really great piece of research where people had looked at using um, video feedback or even just audio feedback as far as providing commentary to students based on their assignments rather than our typical writing because students don't want to read anymore. And you know, if you put down, and I see all kinds of things where they look at the number of the grade and they don't even pay any attention to any of the comments, all they care about is the number. And then if you've got a multi-point submission coming on, then they start asking questions. You go, well, I provided you with feedback on that because they just don't read the comments. And so there's, there's a lot of things, um, advantages that can come from this. And what the research has sort of showed is that the amount of time it takes a faculty member to do grading using video or using audio is actually less than what it takes to do written feedback. Because when you're doing written feedback, you're constantly needing to check if you're going to comment on students' grammar, you've got to make sure that your grammar is not bad in the comment where you're talking about grammar. And so the ability for you to be able to just sort of free flow your thoughts and to sort of give them the comments and the feedback while you're talking and have that being recorded is actually less time consuming than you going and writing all everything out or typing it all in. And most of us are able to talk a lot faster than we're able to type um, at the best of times. And so bringing all that together is where there's a few key things that can sort of make life a little bit easier. The other one that really was significant for me from this one big research study that was done is when they took a look at sections where there were multi-submissions over the course of the term and they were all sort of building on each other, on the sections that had written feedback being applied and those that had uh, audio feedback and then those that had video feedback being applied, what they found was a statistically significant difference in the number of suggestions and comments being implemented in subsequent feedback. And so that was the big one that was sort of saying, it's not just easier for the instructor, but for whatever reason, whether it's the fact that the students are actually listening to the feedback and incorporating it, or it's making more sense to the students because of the way the feedback is being provided. I didn't have the exact um, tests that were done to see if the words were exactly the same whether they were done there in the process of publishing uh, this report. So I didn't have access to all the details of what was there. But it sort of showed that there was the advantage for the students if the feedback that we're taking our time to provide is actually being implemented. Because I know sometimes you feel that, why do I bother? When you make the comments on one submission and the next submission, they're making the exact same mistakes and they haven't sort of applied any of the feedback that you gave them. You sort of like, you know, what was the point of sort of doing that if it's not going to be put into use? And so if this way, if more of them are incorporating your ideas and your suggestions, then it's going to be better in their future grades and sort of help our feedback be what it's really meant to be and be developmental, all right? To be able to help them improve what they're doing as opposed to simply being punitive and say, here's all the things that you missed, you know, let's move on from there. The other thing that they found was that the student's perception of the feedback was higher. Uh, because I know I'm probably guilty of it in that sometimes when I'm grading something and I'm providing written comments, I'm more making sure that I tell them everything that they did wrong. And so when you go back and take a look at those written comments, it really almost sounds like there was nothing good there at all. And you know, um, if you ha add the ability to have voice to that, then there can be sort of like the tonality of your voice sort of saying, hey, you know, it was pretty good, but there were a few things that were here. That, you know, free flow that we have in our conversation is sometimes difficult to get down into the written format when we're providing feedback to students. And so this is where your ability to sort of put it in context and to add inflection to sort of help them get a feel for, well, what do you really think about this? Yes, there were things that we did that needed to come across. And so it really 
almost sort of goes to, it's, it's a win-win-win scenario. You know, the students get like the feedback better, which means they're probably going to pay attention to it. They're actually incorporating the feedback more frequently, which is going to help their performance and help their learning and their grades and everything. And it's less time for us. And so when you put all those things together, it really sort of becomes the, well, where is the downside? Um, some of the other sort of subtle advantages that come in is in the days of digital, and technology, there's always the potential that a student could sort of say, well, I had sort of done that, or there were things that were there, thing, you missed that when what I was doing. Whereas if you're doing a screencast of their assignment and providing audio or video feedback, then you've got that actual tangible documentation. Yes? Screen, screencast is where you're actually video recording what is actually on the computer screen. So like in this case, um, what I'm doing is during this presentation, I'm actually recording or screencasting. So it's actually capturing in one feed exactly what's being projected up here. It's also capturing a feed from the video camera here. So I've got two camera angles, plus it's recording the audio that the computer is doing, plus it's recording my audio. So what you're able to do, and this is where what we see in um, a lot of vi video feedback, and we'll sort of show you this, is like you could have on your computer screen the student's paper on the screen, and you're simply recording that, and then there's a little window in the bottom corner, which is like you, like you're doing a FaceTime conversation, and you're basically providing feedback, but as you scroll through the paper, you can actually highlight and point to certain pieces in the paper as you're reading through, and be adding those audio comments as you're actually working through. And so all of that can be recorded in real time. So as you're going through, it means that you can sort of be a little bit more efficient. But it just records everything that's showing up on your screen. So would you need to have the student doing something electronically to be able to do this? Uh, in one way. And so this is where if you're going to provide it where you're putting the feedback directly on the document itself, then the document would need to be submitted electronically. But the other thing that they, we've seen in other research projects is even if you're grading things that are non-submission based, um, providing feedback on presentations as an example, to just simply be able to go through and sort of give a little bit more detail as opposed to filling out a grade sheet and giving them you know, sort of mark for that you have the ability to sort of give a little bit more detail easily as opposed to working off a grade sheet and something. So even just providing an audio feedback as opposed to written feedback, there is incremental advantages. So basically what the research has sort of showed is if you do with written feedback, that's the lowest advantage. And then if you do an audio feedback, there's an incremental improvement. Then when you do video feedback with no professor's face, then that's better. And then the best is when you actually have your face in the little window, because that adds the personal side. The students like that better, as opposed to having the ghost voice in the background. Um, and so this is where there's, there's a lot of stuff coming on that's talking about like for uh, when you're doing recorded presentations of your class, that the students actually retain more, even if there's just that little window with your face in the corner, as opposed to the voiceover background as you simply flip through the slides on the recording. So simply providing the audio track is better than simply saying, here's the slides, read them, good luck. And, but it's not as good as if they can actually see your face, because they establish a bit more of a connection. And this is especially important in the research that we've seen for distance education courses, where distance students feel a disconnect from the rest of the class because they don't have that same socialization that we have with in-class students and they find that they feel a bigger part of the class when they've got that video connectivity when they're able to sort of have those those conversations with the prof from there actually and then so several come to one thing about no. the distance course actually concordia does that like they have like this uh, like you see them kind of in desk and like the fact whatever it is that they somehow get the yeah. stuff from the computer in the video and uh, <clears throat> I think like because I'm, I'm teaching a web course first time this, this spring and uh, that's one of the things that I'm scared of like, because we never see each other and yeah. like, how to convey there is like written documents explaining like the slides and all that stuff 
mm -hmm. the five modules in there, like tons of written stuff. But I think when you verbally explain something, it makes it makes more sense. We can, we can do a lot of like, stuff that you can actually try to Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, f I found that with distance courses that I do, even if I've got, if there's an assignment coming up, even if I just sort of pop up the, the computer and just hit record the webcam and just sort of talk to the students about what's the assignment coming up, what are the things they need to really think about and consider, just taking a two or three minute little webcam clip that sort of says, you know, here's some of the things, it helps them to sort of feel that it's not just, I'm not just doing stuff, there is an actual real human being behind this web-based content that's delivering it. And there's been other studies that have shown that one of the challenges with distance courses is students don't get in touch with the prof when they have problems as opposed to somebody who when they're in class, they don't ask questions in class, but the minute the class is over, they all intercept you at the end with all those questions, you know, because they want to have that. And they find that if you don't have any of that video time with distance students, they really don't have that connection. But by adding even just a little bit of video stuff of your delivery to them, that the percentage of them that will actually reach out to you with questions because they feel that you're real and that they have, they, they know that you're not this big technology ogre in the background, that you are a human being and, and that they can ask you questions. And so they tend to actually engage more with the prof when you're providing that video element to it, particularly for a distance side from that. David? Well, a few questions. Yep. One is that the second bullet point there, um, we now have like the system on D2L where we put post the marks. Yeah. So if we have that in addition to this, can't they just go to D2L to get the mark? They, 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 they can, and this is where um, one of the studies, some of the people have sort of suggested that you don't post the number on learning management systems until after, so that, you know, if they really want to know, like do it a week after the feedback's been provided. So if they really don't care about the feedback and just want the number, they'll wait the week. If they really are those students that really want to know what can I do, then they can sort of, they can go, okay, I've got the feedback. And rather than saying, all right, your grade for this paper was an 82, because then they go, stop, I've got all I need to know. Then you can provide them with their comments and then say, you know, so with all those things considered, I think that this paper is, you know, this paper is worthy of X grade or an assignment. Sort of, you know, do it as, as after you've sort of gone through the discussions. But yeah, I agree with you that if all you're doing is throwing a number up on D2L, you know, and you do that at the same time, you know, then you can have that. So this is where you can still input the numbers into D2L, but you can have D2L hide them until you until you're ready to sort of open those up. And so you could create a lag period there that would encourage the students to go and review the feedback as opposed to just looking at well what was the grade or the number because I mean that's the, the whole point of providing feedback is so that they can learn and improve you know at least that's you know what I provide feedback for and so if they don't do that or they don't look at that and we see that with all the time I mean back when we used to have paper assignments people would get it back and all they would do is they would look at the number on the front they wouldn't bother looking at any of the written comments in the middle It'd be like okay I got the number toss it in you know, am I happy with this, fine, or whatever, and so there was no improvement. And, that, and that's where the video piece is sort of shown to be, you know, beneficial in that improvement side. I wonder if, as an alternative to all, all these things you yep. mentioned, having students force them to come to the professor's office for, for on-campus corpus and to say, you want your midterm? Come and see me and we'll go over it. Yeah, I think, um, A, they may not bother, and then we're sort of defeating the purpose. And B, if you're teaching a class of 300, oh, yeah. well, then yeah, yeah, yeah. you're, you're going to be spending 80 hours a week sitting in your office meeting with students to discuss their feedback as opposed to you know, doing it. So it could be, I mean, obviously, if they're willing to come to the office, you can sit down and talk with them and stuff like that, then that's great. But then we also have students who may not be geographically able to do that, whether they're doing distance courses or hybrid courses or other things, or they're away that week or whatever, then there's ways to be able to use these tools. I mean, obviously, th these are not 
we're not trying to sort of say that this is the way that things need to be done. We're just simply sort of presenting that there are options out there as opposed to the traditional evaluation methods, that there appears to be some fairly positive benefits of incorporating that into what we do um, you know, in our teaching and where we go from there. Now, the advantage of this from a financial perspective is it can be done for extremely low cost or no cost at all. Um, and this is where many you know, tools or technologies, for example, um, you know, the QuickTime that's built into every Mac computer has the ability to record audio, video, and screencast directly within QuickTime. It's, it's free. It comes already built into it. So there's no additional technology that you need to buy. It's already there sitting on the computers. And so with other systems like with PCs, they have some ability to record with audio, but doing screen capture is not part of the software that's built into a PC. So there are tools that are available to do that. You know, and so there, there's ways that sort of, depending upon the type of system you got, it can get really beneficial. I mean, the bottom line, today's students really rely on video for information. They don't like reading, all right? It's all about watching YouTube. It's all about watching the video content. I mean, you know, even home renovations, you know, you know, who reads directions? You just go onto YouTube and find a video that says how to repair X and then you do it and then you call the contractor to fix what you repaired with your YouTube video and you move on from there. You know, and so this is where because it is a channel of choice and particularly the ability with video on mobile devices these days, um, it's expected that by 2018, 70% of all mobile internet usage will be videos, watching videos. So people are watching tons of content on their mobile devices. They're watching tons of video content. I mean, you know, this is where I've had students that have sent me emails that go, I'm trying to do this, and I looked at a bunch of videos on YouTube, and I couldn't really understand what they were saying. How am I supposed to do? So this is where students, their default before they ask the prof is they go on to YouTube and see is there a video that's got the answer that I need and then if I can't find it on YouTube then I go to the prof for it. You know? And so this is where the video tends to be a default for students of where they go for information. So if that's where they're going, how do we sort of deal with this? Now when we talk about how we provide feedback, there's different levels and it all requires, you know, it depends on what your objectives are, what type of content you're dealing with and what you need to do. You know, the first step is simply doing a simple audio recording, all right? So rather than writing your feedback down, simply providing the audio part of your feedback that can come in, you know, and then providing the students with an audio file that they simply click on and listen to. And in fact, within D2L, if you have students submit work to the Dropbox on D2L, in the little box where you provide all your written feedback, right on the bottom there's a little button that says record audio. So rather than you having to type in all the feedback on that Dropbox submission in D2L, D2L is built in where all you do is you click the button, tell them what their feedback is, save it, and that's actually distributed directly through D2L on their feedback. And so we see this, uh, these things are available in the tools that we've got. One of the other ones that if you have students submitting work in an electronic format, that is a really beneficial way is if you're having them submit it as a PDF document or you're converting their Word files into a PDF document, there is the ability to simply drop in your audio recording onto the PDF document. And the nice thing about that is the ability to add audio comments rather than typing in written comments is built into the free reader version of Acrobat. You don't even need to have the pro version to do audio. You need to have the pro version to add video feedback. But for just providing audio feedback, you can do that directly with the normal free version of Acrobat Reader. So again, Anybody is able to do that and provide that for free. The, the next level is where you go to what's called pen casting. And pen casting, there's two ways that you can go about doing it. And this is really, pen casting is great when you have any sort of mathematical calculations or using formulas or trying to show where did a solution come from, you know, how did you sort of work through the steps 
of a, a calculation or a transaction, this is where pen casting gets really beneficial. And there's two ways to do it. You either can sort of take your webcam and just sort of have your webcam clamped up on something over top of your paper and then be writing and it's recording that video. Or the other option is using a tool like this, which is called a live scribe pen. And so these actually allow you to, as you're taking notes, it can be recording your audio. So you could basically be, um, if you've got, for example, a midterm, you could take each of the questions on the midterm and as you're working through the solution for it, rather than just doing it on a piece of paper, you could be doing the recording of the solution as you're working through it to get your answer key. And then when students have a question, well, where did we get that answer from? They could simply watch the video that shows you writing every step out and the video would basically be the pen marks appearing out of nowhere. The advantage of that of using this versus the webcam is if you're doing the webcam up top, your hand is in the way. And this is all sort of showing, so you got to be really careful with how you write things. If you're using this tool, all it's recording is you basically have this blank screen and you see the pen showing up on the video with your voiceover in the background. And so it's a great way to show how the calculations are being made as opposed to here's the answer. And we'll show you this. You have a strange look on your face. Unfortunately, when you're writing, are you writing on a computer? No, you're writing on paper. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, it is. It's a real pen. And so basically what happens is the way the live scribe pens work is you can either buy these books that have, that uses a dot matrix to sort of keep track of where things are, but you can also just print these pages out through your printer for free. And then all you do is you just, so all I would do is I would turn the pen on. And so it starts up. And so then all I do is I just press the record button. And so now it's recording. So I could write test file up there, I could draw diagrams on here, and then I stop the recording. And then when I put this up, hook this up to my computer, it then actually shows as I was writing everything and where I located it, how I drew things out, so I could do diagrams and draw things in. So stuff that doesn't translate real easy onto slides when you're trying to sort of do a PDF slide with that. And so then I have that video that has my voiceover and I can go in and I can edit and I can change different things, but it basically shows me manually doing the work. The same as what you would do is if you were in a class and you were writing on the screen or writing on the whiteboard, it's basically having that writing appearing on the screen in the background. It actually records all of that. And surprisingly, um, these are, they started around 150 bucks, uh, which is what this one is but we are acquiring um, two of these to have available for faculty to borrow. So you can borrow them to sort of do your recordings and do your answers or things like that because they're an amazing tool just to sort of make life nice and easy to be able to demonstrate that. And so I'll have, uh, when we're done, because some of the things are not gonna be able to be recorded easily, before I put the recording out, I will have some special tutorial videos that will be attached to each of the things. So I'm gonna be able to show specifically how each of these things work in a little bit more detail. So if there's one that you go, well, that's kind of cool, I might be able to use that. We'll have tutorials that will help guide you through. But yeah, it is just a real pen. I'll hand this around so you can sort of see. And it's, it's interesting because like, it, it's bizarre because when, when you first get it, it goes, well, you need to set the date and time. And so you're like trying to figure out, okay, how in the hell am I gonna set the date and time with this? Well, inside the notebook that they give you, it sort of shows settings and then it shows date. So all you do is you press date and then it gives you the date or it will say the date's not set. You can go through and you can manually enter the date. And so basically as you're pressing onto this paper, it's dealing with all the recording. And it's not like there's any electronics in here. This is just paper. I don't know, it's, this, is, this is like magic stuff in the background. You know, as far as how the technology does it, I haven't a freaking clue, but it's cool. You know, and you know, so this is where, just for the ability, um, when you have, like even from a marketing perspective, if you're trying to show how to calculate and do costing, you know, or how to calculate and do pricing equations in marketing, as opposed to sort of having this big formula with a bunch of numbers plugged in and then here's the answer, 
being able to sort of show the manual calculations as you're working through and to be able to provide the commentary overlay so that as you're writing you can sort of say well because we don't know this number we need to bring this in from over here or whatever your explanation is attached as you're basically working through the question and so it's not like they see everything and sometimes if you've got some pretty intense mathematical calculations and you're looking at all the work that's done it can be a little bit overwhelming but if you sort of have it start where there's nothing and you start working through then people can see step by step how do they get there and it can be less overwhelming from the student's perspective to sort of go oh okay yeah the answer looks massive and that there's no way I could figure it out but yeah I understand this piece I understand that piece I don't understand this so they can see well where is the piece in my calculations that I'm having difficulty with and being able to calculate through and so these are you know these are really things I'll just pass these ones around just so you can see what they do and you know for a very small price you know for doing that and making those available it's just <laughs> it is a real pen yeah so now so once you have done then you can get document from yeah you it, it it downloads it as a, a special document that you can export as to a video file and is that a USB port or something yeah it's got a USB port that it's, it's got a little adapter you just plug it into your USB they have three versions they have one that actually works on Bluetooth, and so as you're writing, it's sending everything to your phone or to your tablet if you, if you want to use that. But this one tends to be the most stable because of the fact that it's all recording it directly into the, uh, the pen itself. And so then you just download what you've recorded, and then you can go in and you can edit and manipulate that from there. Where these have really become huge in education is for individuals that have dyslexia or individuals that have learning challenges or disabilities because if they're trying to take notes sometimes their notes may not make sense but if they are, can go back to their notes and like once they've taken a note I can go back onto that page and I can touch any word that I've written on that page and it will play me the recording that was said as that part of the note was made. So for a student that's got a learning challenge or somebody that's having difficulties with, you know, understanding, you know, what they wrote or their note taking or what was the prof saying, they can actually have, you know, everything that the prof has said recorded attached to a particular note. So what the hell, why did I, you know, particularly, and the interesting thing is they can even, um, once you've got the file exported, you can actually go in and you can search for keywords. So what students that get used to using these as their main way of taking notes in classes, when a prof says something like, you know, this next thing is gonna be very important for your midterm exam, a student will just write the word test and then write a bunch of notes. And so then in the exported document, they can search for the word test and find all the places in the recording where the word test was used so they can highlight on that. So it basically turns their handwritten notes into a full searchable database for their preparations. If I were to make you that thing right now, could we test it again and see what it looks like? Sure. No? If, we, if, we, if, we, if, we, if we have if we have time, we can do it. So all you need to do, David, is if you just press the, uh, use the pen and press the record button on the bottom of the, of the page, it should be on the lower left-hand side, there'll be a record, pause, stop. Oh, no, on the bottom, no, on the bottom, on bottom of any page. It's on the bottom of all pages. Okay, okay, so be on the left-hand side page then where the record button is. Sorry. Yep. For example, let's say if I'm, like I'm talking to you, the pen is on. I say, will we record all our conversation? Yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> so you take it so long? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, 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 <laughs> yeah, you, you, can, you, you, can all, you can also set it so yeah, that, like yeah, you can also set it so that it's just recording the audio or you can set it so that it's just recording your written notes. Okay. All right, so you can have it be recording just audio. So like if you go into a meeting, all right, you could have it to just record the audio of the meeting if you don't want to take notes, or if you're the person who's assigned to take notes at that area group meeting, you could just simply, if you have permission, you know, go through and, and you know, re have it recording everything while you're taking notes. So if, when you go back to your notes, when you're writing things out for the meeting, you can go, geez, what did I say here? 
you could just simply go back and take a look and you could hear what the conversation was when you were making those shorthand notes for, for the meeting to see what was going on and taking place, which is where they're used in business quite extensively, is for being able to record meetings. And so at the notes, you're trying to figure out, you know, well, wasn't there something that was said around this? And you can go back eight months, a year, five years later, and as you touch the pen to that particular part of the recording, the audio would play it back for you. So, I mean, and this is where, you know, these, these are used a lot in education, as we say, like even in the K to 12, with students that have learning challenges and the results of it have been phenomenal as far as helping them understand uh, things that are going on. When you've got students who are learning and not their primary language, um, it's a way for them as an individual. Like one of the things that I do with all of my classes is I have an audio recorder that I record all of the classes that I do and the recording of that is uploaded onto D2L afterwards. And so what we hear from a lot of the students whose English is not their primary language, the class may go too fast for them to be translating into their head and understanding what's going on. So if there was a part of the class that they didn't get, they could go back to the audio recording and listen to that piece several times until they understand what was being done about it. This just sort of allows the individuals to do it personally, you know, so they've got their own notes, not relying on the professor to record the class for them. And then they can just download it and put it onto the computer and then it becomes searchable for their studying afterwards. Like, yep. Really the question about the opposite is a little bit of topic. What kind of protocol do we have in terms of recording classroom lecture or discussions? Um, if you are in a classroom, then the, the only issues you would have is if you made that classroom recording available to other students than those in the class unless you advise the students that this class is going to be recorded and will be being used. The same thing like if we're using a video, mm -hmm. all right? If you're gonna video a class, you can do that and show the video to the students in the class because there's no expectation that they would have privacy from the other students in the class. But if you're going to then use that recording to show to next year's class, mm -hmm. then you need to advise them and have their permission and sort of, before you do the recording say, this recording may be being used, you know, and, and so, you know, recommendations are to put that into your course outline to sort of say that some of the sessions will be recorded. And then I actually, when I'm going to do the recording, I actually, at the beginning of the class, make sure people know that it is being recorded just so that there's no confusion that if somebody, if somebody is going to say something really stupid, that they know that they're being recorded when they say that thing that's really stupid. And so if they, if they know they're being recorded and they want to sort of, well, I'm not gonna make this comment right now, then they've got, they've got that option. As, as an instructor, we do have the right to record what's going on. Yes, the difference is the students do not have the right to record us without our permission. Okay, but I think the reality yeah. is that they, they do it. The reality is, is that they do, yes. So I mean, that's just gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, here. absolutely. I don't mind actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, this is where, like, in, from my point of view, um, when I have students that don't come to class, and then the minute the class is over, they're asking questions that we specifically answered in class. My response, rather than giving them the answer, is, well, we discussed that in class, and they go, oh, well, I wasn't able to be there. I had blah, I had blah, blah. He says, yeah, well, that recording's there. You're welcome to go back. So it's like, if they're not going to come to class, it's going to take them as much time to review the information as if they were in class. But, you know, and so this is where there's no real advantage to them from doing that. And so it sort of comes into play from that standpoint. And you can see yeah. it. I didn't, I didn't see that. that yeah, absolutely. And you have much to take apart. Uh, yes. Yeah, and this is where uh, anecdotally um, Diane uh, has been doing recordings of her presentations for her course this semester. And she's not doing the video stuff, just basically the voiceover. And she's had several of the students that have sort of come and sort of said thank you, you know, particularly the international students. And we're going to see that. One of the advantages of using video from a presentation side, like if you're recording your presentations on video, if you upload it onto D2L, it's just there. If you upload it onto YouTube, 
within two hours of you uploading that video onto YouTube, it's automatically closed captioned and translated into 65 languages. And so um, it can be quite beneficial for anybody that has um, a hearing impairment, all right? Or, you know, if somebody is really having challenges with the language, they can go in and sort of see, well, let's get the closed captioning of this presentation in my language so that I can understand, well, what, you know, what words, when you say these words in English, what do they translate to in my language? What do they mean? And where does that come into play? Yeah. Um, I was thinking we can uh, project that sometimes uh, so easily to make it impersonal, but when you are using audio or video, sometimes if you're coming across the same mistake like 300 times, yeah. so it kind of shows, even yeah. if you are having a bad day. So if students start comparing that, um, the next person than I, we had the same mistake, but her tone was so <laughs> that for me. So that's, that that's why all of these tools can be edited. So like you can always go back and I mean, like even when you're doing the written feedback, I find that I need to do that because, you know, when I'm starting off, I'm sort of going, you know, the first student that makes a mistake, I'm like going, okay, this person made this error. But the 50th student that makes the same mistake, it's like, Jesus, why the heck can't they get this figured out? You know, why are they making this mistake again? And sort of going it from that direction. And so this is where, you know, you can bring those things in and find ways to sort of make that work, um, to sort of do that. So yeah, it's, it's just part of, you know, realizing that I'm being recorded right now and thinking about it. But it also allows you to, you know, sort of express your opinions a little bit. Like you say, you know, I can see that you really put a lot of effort in here, but there's a few key things that are going to impact your grade that you miss. So it allows you to sort of not just be saying, here's what you did wrong, but to show a little bit of empathy from the standpoint of the, of the professor to say, you know, I can see you're trying, but there's a few things here you got to get. And I know I find it hard, like when I'm providing the written feedback, I tend to be more clinical in the identification as opposed to being more conversational and saying, you know, I really think he tried here, but you miss, I don't tend to not put those things when I'm doing the written, but I do sometimes when I'm providing the oral comments, when I'm providing the audio, it's sort of, it, it, it just because of the way that we deliver and it makes it a little bit less harsh, generally, at least in some, in my anecdotal experience, uh, what I find is it tends to be less harsh from that perspective. The, when you go to the next level, then you go to screencasting, which is where you have full video, full audio, and everything is available so they can see exactly what's happening as they go along. So just very briefly, if we start at the simple audio uh, part, as Kara was saying, you could just take out your phone, your smartphone, your tablet, hit the record button. You can hit the record button for the audio on your computer and just simply talk to it and just sort of save it or within D2L, all you can do is you can just simply hit the, you know, record audio button directly within the Dropbox on D2L. Let's just show you. Please do not have logged me out. Right. So like just as an example, um, if we went on to a particular submission, and I will black this out when I do the recording afterwards. I haven't actually graded this, so it's good. Come on, load up. So here, when you're providing feedback, over here on the right-hand side, you can either put the written feedback in as you're providing feedback onto that Dropbox. You can attach your feedback file, or there's a button right there where all you do is you press record audio, and so you can just then have your audio that's there and it gets recorded, so when the students go to the feedback, they just press the play button and they hear your audio recording attached to that feedback directly within D2L. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's where you would drop a video. Uh, you would attach a video clip that would be in there. And then that way there, it's protected. It's only within the learning management system. It's not hosted anywhere else. They can't download it or do anything with it. So the feedback is there and it's, it's private directly within D2L. So yeah, you could attach a video clip. You could attach an audio clip. So if you've done um, a pen cast or if you've done an audio recording on your smartphone, rather than recording directly within D2L, you could just attach that MP3 file or that MOV file or that pencast file to that feedback sheet. And so they've got that feedback directly within D2L. And so this is where a lot of these things have the capabilities to be incorporated into D2L, but
but they're not exactly, unless you're sort of looking for them, you know, you don't realize that there's an actual record audio button there and, what, and what's that for to be able to do that. We're so used to our traditional ways of, of providing the feedback as we go. Now, doing the simple audio recording is going to be best for, you know, really work well for general feedback. Like if you're not having a physical document that you're marking, like giving uh, feedback on, you know, contribution grades. You know, so like a midterm evaluation as far as, well, how are they doing on their contribution? Just simply clicking record audio and saying, you know, you've been at most of the classes, however, you're not really engaging in the questions, you're not, you know, talking on the discussion group, so, you know, like your grade for this semester is blank. If you want to improve that next semester, then you can do these things. Just simply taking a few seconds just to sort of your thoughts that you would normally be talking about in your head before you wrote them down on their evaluation paper, it just comes out and then you just click save and you're done. And so doing feedback on presentations, like in your class, Lynn, being able to just sort of have that little voiceover that's there. Um, and so this is where I know sometimes with presentations, if presentations are being recorded, you can actually have a camera recording the presentation and then you can add your audio overlay at per certain parts, whereas you're playing the presentation, you can say, well, here you can see that you were playing with your pen 12 million times, clicking it really rapidly. You might want to work on that. So you can take and you can add commentary to sort of provide a little bit more richer feedback for that the students can sort of go through. Um, doing just the audio recordings can go a long way even just to sort of help provide clarification on assignment instructions because sometimes we may think in our mind that our directions are extremely clear for a particular assignment because we came up with the assignment so it makes sense to us but there may be little nuances that you haven't necessarily articulated in every word that you've written that by being able to sort of provide that and to sort of give them a little bit of a you know a hints and tips you know a, a little minute or 30 second commentary to say, you know, you've got this assignment coming up this week, make sure that you are going through and making sure your references are APA. Just a little reminder, if you will, can sometimes be a little bit more effective at helping them make sure that they're not missing something that you go, well, I wrote it in the course outline, but you know, whether they've actually read it or not is another story. So if you sort of post uh, sort of the, the audio clip and they can listen to it, you can see how many people did it, you know, and you can see how many people didn't. One of my concerns sometimes as I imagine doing that is what about at some point I leave something out or I choose to not do it? Mm -hmm. you know, does it then make the students even more dependent on us reminding them as opposed to I don't, I don't, learning for themselves? Does I, that make sense? I don't, I don't think so. I think there's a, there's a difference between learning for themselves and not having complete information for them to be able to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we handhold them, yeah. but just really providing clarification so that they're not at a loss of understanding, well, what is, you know, if they don't understand what the assignment is, yeah. no, then we, we may not be seeing that. But yeah, I, I can hear what you're saying. Well, I mean, obviously, it would depend upon where you are. If they're a first-year student, then you would be doing that. If they're a fourth-year student, you might not. That might not be a point that you choose to reiterate. Um, but I do agree that they need more repetition of stuff yeah. to get in. Yeah. Yeah, it's unbelievable, really, in terms of what they'll say they didn't know, and I believe them that they didn't know. And yet, when I look at what I provide for them that they ought to have known, it's... You, you will be surprised sometimes, like, like midterm, like I normally provide them detailed solution, but also actually tell them which problem I took from the book or my problem set or mm -hmm. from the slides, how did they change it to come up with that problem? I don't have to do that, but I do that as a source, yeah. solution, conceptual or problem solving. Okay. Still, like I do, like post midterm survey, like see you yeah. in my class, and one of the students have the best to write. Like what we saw in midterm has nothing to do with what we did in class. Yeah. yeah. And like that means he did not even bother to go for the feedback. Yeah. Which I provide. 
for like 20 questions, I had like a 60 page feedback, like in that detail. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it's the same thing, but then again, you know, this is where sometimes having evidence can go a long way. Like I had one student that uh, complained that I marked a particular section and it was never covered. Well, I had the audio recording of the class, I had the video recording of the class, I had the tutorial video that I had that showed that four out of 52 students had watched the tutorial video to show them exactly how to do that, so it was like, you know, it was there. You chose not to attend class and not to use the resources. So, you know, you don't have a whole lot of sympathy at that point, you know, when, when you go down to that aspect. But yeah, it can be there. Now, just to do simple audio recording, um, if you've got a Mac, the QuickTime player goes a long way. The QuickTime player that's built into all Mac computers has a lot of amazing capabilities. You can do audio recording, video recording, and screen recording for free with the built-in software that's built into the Mac. Um, there's no other tools that you need to do. Um, we'll show you that in a second. With a PC, for the audio recording, the sound recorder is an application that's built into the PC software. One that is a little bit better at recording audio is a free tool that you can download from uh, the internet called Audacity. Um, and it's a free tool and it has a lot of more editing capabilities. We also, as Kara mentioned, with an iOS device, you've got the voice memo which is built in. You can just use that, click record to record your audio. There's also a Voice Recorder Pro, which is one of the best ones that's on the iOS store. It's free, and if you want to get it where there's no ads, then it's $3.99 to go with no ads on that. Um, for Android devices, the best one that's out there, oops. Why did we lose the screen? The best one that's out there is, Oh. All right, so if we go to QuickTime Player, and as we open up QuickTime Player, up at the top, next to the file, you have three options up there in the top left. You can do a new movie recording, which will record from your webcam. So if you just want to record your face providing the audio feedback, you would click New Movie Recording, and then it just opens up a screen and right now it's showing connected to my webcam so it's projected 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 so one of those sort of different aspects that goes through there now down here it's showing you what is the audio going to look like and when you're doing it you can click on the pull down and you can choose different cameras that you may have attached so if you've got an external webcam you can choose the webcam that you want to have and you can choose the quality that you want to do, which microphone you want to do, and then it simply records it and saves it as a movie recording. So this is where, if you just wanted to record you um, doing your commentary, if you want to do a audio recording, so you don't want to have a visual of your face, but you just want to add the audio, you just click audio recording there, and it's showing you the audio as you're talking, and then you can choose which microphone do you want to use and what sound quality do you want to have. And then all you do is you simply click the record button and you're good to go. Or the one that's really cool is you can go to a screen recording. So this is where the screen casting aspect, you can click screen recording. And this says, well, which microphone do you want to use? And, um, you know, as we go through, can, you can show the mouse clicks in your recording as well. And so what happens is if I say show my mouse clicks in the recording and I say, well, let's go with the built-in microphone on that. And then I simply press the record button. If I click, it's going to record the full screen. But if I don't want it to record my whole screen, I could simply drag a box around something that I've got on the screen and then click start recording. And now the only thing that it's recording is that little portion of my screen. So if I've got a window open of a website, or I'm trying to show people how to use D2L, or I'm trying to show them, you know, if I've got a particular website that I'm using for my course, and I want to show them how to go through and gain access, I could just drag a box around that particular window of my browser, 
and then as I work through my browser, it's recording just that window, not everything on my computer screen. And so then, once, once I'm done, with once you've got those, you can then export them as different levels of movie format. So once you've got that recorded, you could go through and then you can export it either as audio or different levels up to and including full high definition. So this is where there's a lot of capabilities that we have within that. And we see here, here's the recording that was made. And so it's just showing that portion. And so then I could just simply save that file and everything is directly recorded there. So that's built directly in with every Mac computer. So anybody who's using a map, that QuickTime player gives you everything you need to do to do audio recordings, video recordings, or do full screen casting without needing to buy any additional software. Right? So this is where you can get into things relatively easy. Um, PCs, a little bit more expensive. Um, Suppose you've got a Mac and you've done all this. How do you then get it to the student? Then you just upload it. What happens is when you go, like I could go here, like I'm just going to save this. Um, let's just say this as test three. So it saved that as a movie recording. And so now, like if I opened up, if I went into D2L, dum -de -dum. All right, and so if I went into one of my courses as an example, and let's say I went to course content, let's go to this session here, and I wanted to go, I could choose to um, add a submodule or I could add a file, and if I go to upload a file, I just choose the movie file, and it actually embeds the movie clip directly into D2L. Then, then, then you can you can send it just to that student, or the other option. So you could put it in an email to them. So when you do an email, you just put that as an attachment. Okay, this by, by yeah. Well yeah. This yeah. Or, or the other option is is that you could, um, you know, just put it into a, their Dropbox feedback. So in the feedback, if you're providing something, you could record it, and then you just like we saw the record audio, mm -hmm. we attach a file. You would just put the recording into that part, and then they would have that video recording as their feedback all directly within D2L. And so it's a very, you know, it's, it doesn't require a lot of elaborate tools, although you can get very elaborate depending on what you're doing. Karen? Are videos too big to send by email? Uh, depends on how long it is. The money email is getting better. Is it 10 minutes or something? Yeah, they've, they've gotten better with things, but with, when you put things into D2L, there's no limit to the file size of what you put into D2L and the feedback. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is where, depending upon what your content is of what you're doing, like if it's something for the entire course, then I would drop it into D2L. The advantage of that as well, particularly for distance, is that as opposed to uploading it to YouTube, students who may be in China, can't access YouTube from China, but if the video is embedded into D2L, they can watch the video within D2L. So they lose the advantage of being able to do the translation, but it exists within D2L, so it's easy for everybody to access. And I mean, it's actually surprisingly fast to drop a video into D2L. Um, it's actually faster than doing it into YouTube because YouTube is doing it so slowly to make sure it's got super high quality. But you can drop a video presentation into D2L or video feedback into D2L very quickly. Like it doesn't take, it's not like time consuming from the upload bandwidth aspect at all. And so it's just sort of, you know, we've got the ability to, to do these things, but we've been sort of in this, uh, you know, usage where we typically just go through and use our existing tools that we've got. Now, one of the things that I want to sort of show you is using Acrobat. Uh, because Acrobat 
if you have students submitting things electronically, whether it's a Word file or a PDF file, Acrobat has a lot of great capabilities of things that you can actually do. So for an example, if we, uh, let's just get rid of this one. If I go in and if I simply open up Acrobat Reader, so this is just the free version of Acrobat that you can download and anybody can access from the internet. If I go and I go to open a file and I downloaded one onto my desktop just before the session today, so this is an undergraduate application for admission. If so, if for example, this was a student assignment and I'm grading the student's assignment, I could either, if I'm going to grade with this, click on the little speech bubble and add a little sticky note and then type my comments and feedback at that particular part. And depending upon how many comments I have, it could look like a bad MTV pop-up video with all these little bubbles all over their paper. It could be a little bit intimidating. The other option that we have, and this is you've got available whether you're using a video format or not, let me just collapse this up, is over here when you click, rather than click on just the comment section up top, but if you click on the comment button bubble over on the right hand side, that then takes you to the full comment uh, tables that you can do. And so this is where it allows you to add text and bubbles or cross throughs. So it gives you a lot more that you can do, including one of my favorites. Well, you've got the one where you can attach additional work, but this is one of my favorites. All you need to do is to simply click. And when you click on that, and then you can move that cursor wherever, and then it opens up the sound recorder and you basically can record audio and it leaves a little speaker at those particular places in their paper. And so when the student gets the PDF file and everybody can read PDFs, they can sort of go to it and they just click on all of those little speakers and they can hear your audio comments directly on that document. And so by doing that, you know, we could go through and add that recording device and click that onto there which really can sort of make things a little bit easier for students as they go through to be able to get their feedback of what they need to do. And that's built in. Uh, the, yeah, this is, this is done within Acrobat. And so this is where, you know, with, by ha with stuff being submitted as PDFs, and everything can be converted to PDFs these days, you know, whether you're exporting it from Word or whatever, PowerPoint or all that stuff. Once it's in PDF, you've got that capabilities. With the pro version, of Acrobat. Uh, if you have the pro version, let me just open up this. All right. You have the same normal comment section, but down in the bottom of the window here, there's a new icon that you don't have on the free version. That's called Rich Media. So, what that allows you to do is if you've recorded a feedback, or as an example, if you've recorded how to do a particular calculation. So this is where if you've got a question that you're asking and students are submitting it as part of an assignment and you've shown how to do the work, rather than having to make the same comments over and over again on multiple papers, all you do is you simply just attach the video of how that question was done on the ones where the students did it incorrectly and so you're, you, you record it once, and then you just drop it in. And so the students then in Acrobat would simply press play, and they would see the video that you've recorded that would play at that particular part of their PDF file. Uh, so that could play the video. Do you need the, the professional version? Nope. Just the, just the free version. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, once, once you've put the features in with the pro, then everything is readable within the, within the free version. So they don't need to, ha they can just download the free version of Acrobat. They can watch the videos. I mean, you, you can make the audio with the free version as well. So the only thing that you need the pro version of Acrobat for is to be able to embed a video onto the PDF feedback if you're doing it from that standpoint. David. It's an outrageous $450 US for pro version. They're just trying to buy it. But Memorial's price for University Pope 
computers is just like 119 Canadian. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, and, and depending upon what you need, there are a certain number of licenses that I think we have. I don't know. There are, or maybe faculty do need to pay. I'm not 100% certain. I've got a, I use a different version, so. But yeah, yeah, don't, don't buy directly. Buy the university license. They, they look after, they have good educational licenses uh, with those that are there. Now, the, so that's where you can take things to that next step and use um, Adobe Acrobat to sort of add that video and audio feedback. Pen casting, what we've sort of talked about, where we take a look, this elevates above the webcam and where it moves and takes a look at using the live scribe pens to bring the information together. And as I mentioned, we are acquiring two of these. Let's see what you got here, David? I, what I did was I made some calculations, just to stop me, too great to do, but I made a deliberate mistake, because as, as you know, yeah. somebody might, just to show what it'd be like, I paused it and then restarted mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. showed the right answer. So there's, um, so uh, there's just right. two recordings on here, if, I could, if you wanted to. Um, so if I open this up. Yeah. Yeah, and I could have. I, yeah. I, so I couldn't say words as I was as you were talking. But yeah. Course, yeah. And so can. as I move the pen to a different spot on the paper, yeah. it's showing the recording of what we were talking about in class. So it's recognizing where it is on the screen. And if we sort of take this, and if I'll export this, and I'll send you a copy of it, so you can see that what it will be showing is the video will actually show these numbers as they're being appearing out of magic, out of the air. The, the, the mistake that there was I know, it was intentional. <laughs> <laughs> the, the wonders of post-production. You can get rid of all kinds of mistakes in post-production. But yeah, so I mean, that's, that's as easy as it is. It just, you know, you can just type, a, you know, put your pen on any particular part and you can hear what you were saying at the time that that was done. And then you can always go in and edit with any of those tools. So, I mean, these are just an amazing little device that is a real pen that allows you to do things. And like, I think that one was $158 or something at Best Buy, I think is where they're at right now. Either $150 or $170. But we will have ones available um, for loan to be able to do that. And that's simply the Echo One that has um, a memory that it's got. So is everyone going to see this video uh, afterwards? No. No, they're not. It's just who's sending things to you? I'll, I'll, show, I'll send it just to you, unless you, unless you want me to share it with the others that were here. I share it. I just want to explain how, how you use that class. You yeah. say, OK, I've done it. I've got an answer. I've tried to verify the answer. And verifying it, because I made a little bit of a mistake, they're not the same. Then the FDOL will start at the beginning to find out where the error is. You find it is actually made at the end, and then you can reconcile it and make it right. Absolutely. And, and, and explain what I couldn't say. Yeah, you know, and, and that way you're able to then articulate the process yeah. that they need to be thinking as they do the answer, as opposed to just plugging in numbers into a formula and assuming that it's going to be correct at the end without knowing how to check their work and verify, does it pass the logic test? Does it meet all these criteria? And so those are the types of things that are hard to be able to present in a written document yeah. as far as processes. So things where they're working through, and, and this is where it's, it's not about using these all the time, it's about using them for a specific application that they're appropriate for. You know, what does it fit? What really fits with that component? And so this is where when you go to the next level, you've got the screencasting element um, that we showed. And depending upon where you're going, audio can be a big thing. Um, having a Blue Yeti microphone, such as this one here, is amazing. We, I'll use this in, when we're dealing with remote training. It looks like an old school. It does. But, but I mean, you can put that microphone, like when I'm doing remote training, I can have that microphone in the middle of a class, and I can hear every single student in the class with that microphone in the middle. It's amazing pickup. The best webcams are a Logitech uh, webcam. This is the one where you can either just set it on your computer, or you can have a little tripod so you can move it out. Better than having the internal one because sometimes depending upon the angle, the internal camera may be sort of pointing up your nose or whatever and it may not be the most flattering you know, angle. So with these, you can sort of move them around and part of the kits that we're getting together is we will have, starting off with two kits that will have Blue Yeti microphones and these webcams that will be available in a, a case that you'll be able to sort of sign out 
to be able to do your recordings and to do that because they are the, really the best ones that's on the market right now. And so our initial sort of loaner library is going to be two of the um, Echo Pens and two of the Blue Yeti microphones and webcams to sort of come into play. Um, obviously, as we showed you, you can do this with QuickTime to do the little screencasting. You just grab a little window um, if you've got a Mac. The other tool that is very low cost and easy to use is called Screencast-O-Matic. All right, it's cool names. But anyway, they've got a free version that limits you to a 15 minute recording and you can save it as a video file. Doesn't have any built-in editing tools, but you can go to the pro version and the pro version is $15 a year that doesn't have the Screencast-O-Matic watermark on it. And so for 15 bucks a year, you get no watermark, you can make longer recordings, you can just do audio recordings if you've got a Windows computer. And this software is available for both Mac and PC, so it works for both. So at most, if you go with the pro version to get rid of the watermark, 15 bucks a year, you've got the ability to do what you need to do the screencasting as you go. As you move up, the other couple of tools that are really powerful is Snagit. Um, Snagit is a great little tool both for Windows or Mac that allows you to grab a certain piece on your screen and record it or save it. Uh, Delts uses Snagit a lot. It's one of the tools that they absolutely love. They have an education pricing which is 30 bucks. One of the ones that I really like is actually called Reflector um, and it's from a company called Squirrels. But what Reflector does is it allows you to be able to, if you're trying to show something on a tablet or a smartphone, it will actually wirelessly, without having to connect anything, it'll put your smartphone onto the screen and has a record button. So you can record what you're doing on your smartphone or on your tablet, and it automatically records that as well as a webcam. And it's an outrageous price of $14.95. All right, and it's really simple and easy to use. We'll have some tutorials showing each of these um, that we'll have uploaded um, probably in about a week or so for everybody so you can see. When you go to the more higher end editing capabilities, there's really tool tools that are out there. There's Camtasia, uh, which is one that allows you to actually incorporate uh, full quizzing, full testing, you know, it is the high-end online education sort of training tool. Um, it's available for both Windows or Mac. For Windows, it's a $240 piece of software is their education version, so it is not a cheap tool. Um, it's the type of thing that DELTS would use to sort of produce things, and so if you've got something that goes to the point of needing Camtasia type work, then DELTS would process that for you. So they would work with you to sort of develop that. Um, their Mac version is $99.68 Canadian. That's just because it's estimating the exchange rate between US and Canada dollars. Cheaper for one than the other. Um, because it's the PC version does a little bit more than the Mac version. And most Mac users will not use Camtasia. Mac users will use ScreenFlow. ScreenFlow is um, Mac only, and it is an amazing software that allows you to bring multiple different elements in. You can zoom in on certain pieces, you can sort of do animated flips. I use ScreenFlow to do all of my recordings for my classes uh, because you can have your PowerPoints going, you can add you know, other elements from the internet and copy everything in, and it allows you to sort of edit your audio and crop things in so when you say something stupid, you can go, <laughs> let's just delete that little piece and not have that there. You know, as you realize, or when you go, geez, I could do better with that, then you just sort of take a pause for a minute and then you just edit those pieces out, and then you can save that as a movie file and upload it onto D2L or onto YouTube. And so this is where, when we move into these, these are sort of the higher end tools as you've sort of maybe tried some of the other software and sort of went, okay, what can we do with this? And you go, wow, this is really easy. I want to do more with this. You may want to sort of add some different elements. Then you can go to the higher end tools that are there. So once you've got the stuff created, where do you put it? As we sort of mentioned, one of the things is with D2L, 
you've got the ability to upload the videos directly in D2L. You can do the assignment feedback directly in there. When you upload to YouTube, YouTube has three types of ways that you can upload videos. You can upload videos either as a private video, which means you designate only those individuals that are able to watch it. So you could designate just the students in your class would be the only people on the planet that would be able to watch that video. Or you could go with an unlisted video. An unlisted video means anybody that's got the URL would be able to watch the video, but it doesn't show up in search or anything. The advantage of YouTube is within about two hours of uploading a video onto YouTube, it has been automatically closed captioned and translated into 65 languages. So if you're creating content that, like recording a class or a presentation or an example of something, you may want to upload it as either an unlisted or a private video onto YouTube, and within a day or so after you've uploaded it, go in and YouTube is getting much, much better at their closed captioning, but they still have challenges sometimes with the Newfoundland accent, and they may not pick up things, but it's simple, you can go in and you can edit the words that they've got wrong, and it's actually very, very efficient with things. If you've got some clear speaking, or if you need a, and you can also, once you've done that, you can download the transcript after YouTube has done your transcription services for you. So if you've got a video and you want to get a transcript of it, just upload it as a private video to YouTube, come back in a day or so, and then download the transcript. Or make the edits that they didn't do, and then download the full transcript of what you've uploaded. So we'll have, as I mentioned, tutorials to sort of walk you through step by step of each of the different tools. The main purpose of our time here face to face today with the, was to sort of say, there are a lot of opportunities that you can do to be able to add value to your students, thanks Ash, that are not going to be extensive, that's not gonna require you to go buy a lot of things that could be done relatively easy. And what I would encourage you to do is to just experiment with even some of the free tools that we've sort of presented to just sort of say, okay, well, what would this do? And maybe even just do it, if you're teaching a class, do it with one of, you know, do normal feedback on a first assignment, and then maybe provide audio feedback on the second assignment, and then get feedback from your students. You know, what did the students think? You know, were they like, well, I was pain in the ass having to listen to what you said, or I can't stand the sound of your voice, I have to listen to it in class all day, or whatever. But, you know, get feedback from what's there. And what we're hearing from classes that are incorporating more and more of these tools is that the feedback is very positive from the student standpoint. And so, you know, now that you've got a little bit of better awareness of what the opportunities are and that there's some things that we're going to be providing technology-wise within the faculty to help support you, as well as tutorial videos, and I'm more than happy to work with any of you that are going, I'm going to do my first one, can we sit down for 10 minutes and, and you know, help walk me through this to show me how to sort of put this together. More than happy to sort of do that and sort of, you know, take the process through, help you with anything along the way, whether it's the editing or, you know, what do you, if you're, if you in your mind have a particular vision about what you want, but you're not quite sure what's the best way to present that, or if you've got a particular type of content that you want to deliver in your class and you're not certain what's the best way that would be the most effective, you know, when you want a second opinion on some thoughts about how it might be able to be presented, I'm more than happy to sort of assist with that and uh, to give you any guidance along the way. But we will have these, I'm um, expecting that probably, uh, well, before, probably in about six weeks, because the pens are on back order right now, so probably in about six weeks, we will have the kits available um, from the technology side, and we'll have things sorted out at that point as far as how you go about, where they're going to be housed, where do you go about booking, and all of that stuff, because um, hopefully the demand is going to be more once people sort of know that what they can do and that it actually saves them time just to simply you know hit the record button and then provide the feedback and you might even be surprised that the quality of your feedback you might find it's actually better at least that's what i find in my opinion is some of the feedback quality that i do i'm happier with what i provide them when i do the audio recording than what i do when i do the written recording you know because i always try to go back and review what i've written and, and i'm 
find myself editing what I've written a lot because it doesn't really articulate what I wanted to say, but if I was just simply saying it, then it saves me a lot of editing time and gets to be better feedback, in my opinion, for the students. Everything David. you said today is kind of in the context of the professor giving the feedback, but for many courses, have TAs who uh, mark assignments or yep. something, so they could just they can, act as a proxy, do the same absolutely. technology, to go to D2L. And, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so they could do the same thing, particularly because there's so many free tools that are there. Um, and so this is where the other thing that you could do is you could then, you know, if there are things, there could be comments that the TAs make, and then if there's something where you feel that you know there needs to be a little bit more emphasis, you could add your commentary on top of theirs. And so because so sort of like both of them, you know, this is now coming from David, so we better really pay attention or whatever the case may be is there. But, you know, it's all about using the right tool to help achieve whatever you're trying to do with the students. Thank you very much for taking the time to come today. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was slightly intimidating. <laughs> this is why I say, you know, this is, you know don't, don't jump in and say, okay, well, I'm going to go get, you know, download the trial of Camtasia and play with it. It's like, no, just... Just go in with just the little quick time. Do the quick time thing. Just try doing an audio recording and go, geez, that's it. I can get my head around quick time. Yeah. I noticed that there is something called a quick time player for Windows. Yeah. Can I use that on my PC? Um, you can. I don't know if that one has the same recording capabilities there. I see. I'm, I'm not 100%. So I don't, my problem is, is my. The only PC I have in the house is so old. Okay. Um, I haven't done that, but I mean, okay. you know, we could take a look at that. I don't, so I don't, ha unless I came into school and took a look at it and sort of worked through that, but I haven't done that yet. So because I work with the Mac, okay. that's what I work that's with. It. But it, it might be, it, they might have the capabilities to do it. Yeah, maybe. But if not, the Screencast-O-Matic yeah. one mm -hmm. is, is a good alternative to that default QuickTime one in, in, uh, in there. Yeah, that is really helpful.